We're gonna start with the classic, Who's My Mummy? Around the year 1341 BC, a royal child is born by the name of Tutmahaten, the living image of Aten. Sometime after dad's death, Tut rebrands to Tutmahan. This is because his dad is the legendary dumb Akhenaten, who tries to force monotheism. Anyway, some scholars believe that Tut's mom was Ak's principal wife, Nefertiti, but others believe his mother was the secondary wife named Kia. But with either theory, we run into the issue that it's not entirely certain that Ak was even Tut's father, getting cheated on by both wives. That's when you know you're doing something wrong. It's quite possible that Tut's father was the pharaoh Smun Akhara. While DNA tests of several, while DNA tests of several mummies found in the Valley of Kings seem to indicate that Tut's father and mother are buried not far. Egyptologist Marianne Eaton Cross also points out that whereas these mummies are very clearly close relatives of Tut, it's actually difficult to establish precise familiar relationships using only DNA. Egyptian royal families like to preserve the bloodlines, so his mom could also biologically be his sister and cousin, and all of that would show up as an indecipherable mix that does nothing to confirm more than just a relation. If it is Nefertiti, the question remains, where's my mummy? In more recent years, speculation about King Tut Tut's tomb is that Queen Nefertiti, whose tomb and sarcophagus are long lost to us, is buried somewhere within. This claim is made by Egyptologist Nicholas Reeve, who realized that the cartouches depicting Tut had being buried by his pharaonic successor I had been painted over cartouches of Tut burying Nefertiti. Reeve said close inspection of I's cartouches reveal clear underlying traces of an earlier name, that of Tut. In its original version, this scene had shown Tut performing the funerary rite over the tomb's original owner, his immediate predecessor Nefertiti. The new evidence, specifically the north and east walls of the treasury being man-made structure whilst everything else is cut stone, does support the theory that Tut's tomb is only an outer section of a much larger tomb prepared for and still occupied by Nefertiti, whose own independent sequence of funerary chambers lies beyond. It would also add context as to why the king had such a small, oddly shaped burial chamber. But if someone does lay beyond those walls and it's not Nefertiti, then knock knock Who's there? Few scholars share Reeves' optimism that any new chambers contain Nefertiti's tomb. There's something about her specifically that fills archaeologists with dread and defeat like she's the popular hot girl at school who would never look at them. The desire to find her mummy is potent as it would be a tremendous discovery and greatly contribute to the study of ancient Egypt. Frank Rahil of the University of Zurich compiled a list of other royal relatives that he felt could be interred there, including Tut's older sister, Mary Hatton, his possible mother, Kia, and of course, Smen Kahara. There is a belief, however, that if it is Smen, while well, Nefertiti died, Tut had her interred with him. Possibly because, as mentioned, the dude could be his dad, but also maybe Tut knew his mom loved this guy more than Ak. I don't know, I don't got time for ancient Egyptian Kardashian drama right now. All I'm saying is this Tut could have cracked that tomb open, buried Nefertiti, closed it back up, and when he died, he got buried in the frontmost room. Since that highly debated viral clip was mentioned, I'll make the next point about how gratitude is implied. Which which it's most definitely not. I don't see a lot of gratitude coming from royal families. There is endless videos and pictures of these sour-faced monarchs harassing and devaluing the endless service they have accompanying them. Let me hit y'all with an iconic example. Have you seen Downton Abbey? Most folks have. Have you ever noticed one of their royal or aristocratic characters ever say thank you to their servant? No? And that's an intentional detail, as it's been a long since unspoken, at least in British monarchy, that servants are best unthanked and unheard. Now, Alistair Bruce in the BTS documentary about the TV show series explained his perspective, that the servants did everything for their masters, and if thanks were given, it would be necessary to say them at least 60 times a day. That would be, as the English say, tiresome. It does stand that servants are not required to be thanked no matter if they just tied your shoe or wipe your you as a royal have the right to just scoff and point and expect results. But at least one royal who can't verbally berate you is the revered royal pets. Multiple royal houses and their respective rulers have decided to use these rules and servants to treat their pets as an extension of themselves. By personifying them, even just trimming a corgi's nails too short could get you proverbially beheaded and definitively fired. Some famous examples of royals who have servants service their pets are Queen Elizabeth II staged a funeral for a chameleon and 
and an Indian ruler Muhammad Mahabat Khan threw a lavish elaborate wedding for his dog. Louis of France took being a cat person to a whole other level and basically turned Vassals into a giant breeding ground. Charles II of England issued a royal law that his iconic King Charles Spaniels, which are obviously named after him, have license to walk anywhere in the kingdom without harassment, even parliament. And of course, who can forget Caligula, who appointed his favorite horse, Icaritas, as an official senator. But I'd have to say, I imagine there's not much worse than food tasting. Normally, you'd be able to think this wouldn't be so bad. Wrong. Let me make it worse. So obviously, they're tasting it for poison and other tricky little substances that could be take down a king. What if the soup was laced with arsenic? How easy is it to slip into the kitchen and lace the king's food with belladonna or hemlock? The food tester was always a servant, or sometimes even a slave, or a prisoner. And if you think about those status of those people, well, they were eating mush flour and bone broth and then calling it a day. Given the opportunity to be a food taster means the literal taste of luxury. The only effed part is the first bite of flavorful rice you're ever going to eat in your life, you're going to immediately die, maybe. It'd be enough for you to put off eating any meal you didn't prepare yourself, and there'd be no way of knowing if the food was deadly until you've after you've eaten it. In 1594, there was a plot to poison Queen Elizabeth, apparently the king of Spain, as the Spanish were enemies of England at the time. A group of Portuguese men had agreed to carry out the dirty work, including the queen's own physician, Rodrigo Lopez. Once the plot was uncovered, all men were executed. And it's not just our ancient royals that brought people on to do this task. Naturally, President Putin has a food taster as part of his security team. No hoovering, which is British for don't vacuum. In 2011, Royal Servants was uploaded to YouTube, a documentary that gave insight into what it's like working for the royal family, including accounts from former butlers, chefs, nannies, and footmen. To quote the narrator, the best servant is one that is neither seen nor heard. The royal family demands the most professional servants in the world, the kind of servants that would rather die than make a mistake. She continues on in this not pretentious at all breakdown saying that behind the scenes, butlers lay out clothes, footmen carry early morning trays, and cleaners sweep carpets, lest royal ears are offended by vacuum cleaners? One rule cleaners must follow is that they have to sweep the floors instead of hoovering them because the sound may be too loud, especially in the early morning. I don't know if you guys have seen these palaces, but they're about 110% red carpet, and it's not that cheap kind. This stuff probably holds holds onto dirt the way your homie holds on to their cheating ex. Not being permitted to use such modern inventions makes their job not even a little, but a lot more difficult. Immensely. They have to quite literally sweep the carpets, the most ineffective way to clean a carpet that's tacked into the ground. And they're already being held at a higher standard than really any other servant on earth. But don't forget, after you're done measuring the carrots, you feed the horses, and sweeping a carpet, you also have to kiss the linens. Whichever unfortunate servant was tacked with making Henry VIII's bed after he woke up in the morning, was then required to kiss every part of the linen to prove he hadn't smeared poison on them. What? Don't get me wrong, Henry was like intensely and increasingly paranoid. You can go check my recent video, Top 10 King Henry VIII Facts You Never Knew, to learn more about his whole mess. But anyway, someone screws the pooch. Pretty sure it's Ambroise Parch, the 16th century French royal physician who once wrote, now poisons do not only kill, being taken into to the body, but some being put or applied outwardly. And now, this delusional hypochondriac finds out the poison can sink in through his skin, not just be ingested, and he insists on this gross ritual. In an era where sheets don't get washed, and he doesn't wash, and he's all sweaty and gouty, and banging tons of biddies in that bed. Imagine having to kiss those sheets every morning. That's the real poison. RIP, dude. Mint essence oil under the nose, and I'm just praying for you. When the standard of hygiene is so low, your only request is that X marks the spot. Eleanor Harmon, the author of The Royal Art of Poison, says royal palaces, some courtiers don't even bother to look for a chamber pot, but just dropped their britches and did their business. All of their business. All of it. All of it. In the staircases, the hallways, or the fireplaces. In Versailles, women just pulled up their skirts to pee where they stood, and some men urinated off the balustrade in the middle of the royal chapel. The smelly truth is that Hampton Court, that of Henry VIII, was not well equipped to serve the bodily needs of hundreds upon hundreds of hundreds of servants. During the king's boisterous banquets, busy servants regularly needed the call of nature, so they relieved themselves in hidden hall 
hallway corridors or on sizzling fireplaces that were cooking the food. I, I need a minute with that one. Anyways, the walls reeked of urine so badly that according to historian Lucy Worsley in her book If Walls Could Talk, the palace management would have had crosses chalked into the walls with the hope that people would be reluctant to desecrate a religious symbol. That's right. While servants were always encouraged to pee in vats, oh you know, so their urine could be used to clean later, to keep servants and courtiers from urinating on the garden walls, Henry had large crosses painted in problem spots, I guess. But instead of deterring men from relieving themselves, what it did was literally give them a target. To fix the problem, Henry VIII then realized he had to make bathrooms. So he constructed a giant toilet block by the River Thames called the Great House of Easement. And of course, last but not least, fresh out the kitchen of Henry VIII is Dee's roasted chestnuts. King Henry VIII's kitchen at Hampton Court Palace was one of the largest kitchens in Europe. And obviously, it would have had to be to service the banquets of grandeur I was just talking about. Talking about. There were huge wood fireplaces producing an average of 800 to 1,000 meals in a day, courtesy of just a mere 200 cooks. Naturally, that amount of ovens and that amount of cooks in the kitchen, yeah, it's downright cozy. And the average of 1.3 million logs were burnt, creating a hellish atmosphere, leaving the cooks drained and drenched in sweat. From roasting meats to boiling cauldrons, the kitchen of Henry VIII was no less than passing as the underworld. So, what happened in all this heat, dare say? Did they cry? a window. Did they get some ice? Take a smoke break, maybe. Nah, the cooks just took off all their clothes to tolerate the temperature while it's cooking. Just to reiterate, all their clothes. All of them. But alas, the atrocities were never ending for these men, as King Henry VIII issued an order to stop being naked or in garments of such vileness as they do now, nor lie in the nights and days in the kitchen or the ground by the fireside. To combat the problem, clerks of the kitchen were instructed to purchase honest and wholesome garments for the staff. And guess what? that was. There's a reason the apron covers the front. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around. Around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift. Gift. But if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. 
And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. At number 7, Mother Knows Best I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up 6 feet under that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessor. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar, Queen Rana Valona, was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Brana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Ranilova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's horrible. Ranilova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman. He is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope. 
way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert. They viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know, there's only one right answer. I number three, evil empress. This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part-time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number 2. Ice Palace If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is going to get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house. This massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me. I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. Fatal herbs. Ying Zeg was born in China in 259 BC. Declared himself King Shi Huang, or the first emperor of the Qi dynasty, at age 38. He reportedly proclaimed that his dynasty would last 10,000 generations and wanted to be around long enough to see that prediction come true. Pretty difficult for the average human, especially in 259 BC, to live that long, so in order to make it happen, he needed to be immortal. According to the news agency Xinhua, 2017 analysis of 2,000 year old texts dating to the emperor's rule shows his obsessive quest for an elixir that would bring him eternal life. A researcher discovered texts pertaining to an executive order issued by Qin Shi Huang demanding his subjects search for something that can keep him alive forever. He believed in an old myth that there were three spirit mountains in the sea inhabited by mortals. He used his soldiers to look for herbs and such that would grant him immortality and then drink them as elixir. 
elixirs. Unfortunately, Shi Huang did not find the correct elixir and passed away 11 years later at 49. Turns out a lot of these elixirs were often made by alchemists and had traces of mercury in them, which is suspected to have caused his demise. At number 9, body parts. In the 17th century, dead body parts called mummai were often sold to apothecaries and physicians. Why would they need body parts you ask? Well, in those days, many believed that these parts contained some form of life force left over from the person, thus containing healing powers for medicine. When it came to royalty back then, living a long life was the goal, so in order to have the best chance at healing, royalty was often prescribed mamiya, made of a healthy person or a young person. The medicine could be ingested by swallowing or rubbing it on an injury. So basically, royalty was paying for crushed up people so they could eat them or rub them into their skin. They had so much faith in mamiya that it was believed to be able to treat serious ailments like coughs and epilepsy. Some of the royals who believed in the method were King Charles II and King William II of England. England, Francois I of France, Christian IV of Denmark. The medicine was in such high demand back then that some even took to digging up Egyptian graves and tomb robbing them for valuable bodies. The practice luckily died out in the 18th century. At number 8, Lavish Horse Stable. Gazius Caesar Augustus Germasius, better known by his nickname Caligula, was the third Roman emperor ruling from 37 to 41 AD. Caligula was described as an insane emperor who was self absorbed and short tempered, taking lives on a whim and indulging in too much spending and engaging in affairs. Apparently, he was accused of sleeping with other men's wives and then bragging about it and taking lives just for the fun of it. One thing Caligula did love was his horse, Incitatius, who he would feed regular treats to and even paid for a stable to be made out of marble. Soldiers were even ordered to hush the neighborhood if the horse was asleep. Caligula also deliberately wasted money constructing a two mile floating bridge so that he and his horse could gallop along it. There was already a financial crisis going on so the bridge money led to citizens starving. Probably the craziest idea he had was that he planned to appoint his horse to the high office of consul, but luckily for his people he was assassinated before he was able to do so. Number 7 Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider Man guy. That's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board. He was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so. So for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush hush. Even in royal standards, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs and Joan thought Tom Hall and Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just you know marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the 
the Dispensers, and became Queen Regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Home, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Architatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you, or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. 
Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for club. What, we gonna start with, why are you so stingy? You literally live in a castle. You have gold doubloons like an effing pirate, priceless spices stolen from foreign lands, and gemstones harvested fresh from the earth. But you're gonna have us measure every loaf of bread so they're the exact same? Back in the late 1500s, Viscount Montagu demanded meticulous records of every expenditure. The clerk of the kitchen was a crossbreed between an extreme couponer and a professional nitpicker, who had to provide the cooks with the ingredients for every meal in exact amounts for each person to be served, and ensure that each plate had the exact same weight and proportions laid upon it. Among his many duties was also to ensure every wheat loaf that went in the oven weighed 18 ounces, and was 16 ounces when it was taken out. What happens if they weighed more or less? Off to the bread breaking wheel, or maybe the sourdough slow slice? Off to the steak for a little French toasting, huh? Anyway, for how the British monarchy would pitch a fit over a three letter word children, not kids. Because we all want to speak a little bit more like Mary Poppins. Oh, yes, little children, off to bed we go. Nah, dude. I couldn't do the whole royal nanny thing, to be honest. The, the education required enough makes you think that they're scouting for NASA, not someone to stop their kid from picking its nose, publicly, at least. Maria Barrett. Hello, the nanny who takes care of Prince George, Princess Charlotte, and Prince Louis, trained at the notable Norland College in Bath, England, before being hired to the world's most famous children. At this college, students like Borallo study early years development for three years. However, as well as learning social and emotional development, students are also taught the importance of vocabulary. There is one word that royal nannies are prohibited from using to describe royal children. Kids. Ask me why. Come on. Ask me. It's because of the exact honky dory dumbass reason you think. It's the baby goat thing. Kids is a name for them and an informal name for children because who says that it's not the Victorian era? According to Heron, the word kid is disrespectful and dissuades royal children from being seen as individuals. You mean like how sheltering them and not allowing them everyday friends or normal reality or exposure to the real world under the guise of safety, but it's more so they grow up in a bubble of unrealistic world perspective and can't understand problems morally and empathetically as an adult, only in a political sense. You mean like that? Sounds like what they're doing. And speaking of the Windsors, did y'all know Charles specifically sucks? A lot of kings imposed a lot of rules for their servants, but something about King Charles gets the most under the skin. Maybe it's because he had some pretty frivolous, unrealistic asks for a man who just got the throne this year. So listen to his tea procedure alone. Charles is very particular for how his tea is served when he's visiting the Paladinian house. When preparing the tea, you must use a teaspoon measurement of tea leaves per cup and then there must be an exact temperature of 7 degrees Celsius for green tea and 100 degrees Celsius for Earl Grey or English breakfast. The prince's hot beverage must also be checked with a thermometer before being served and honey should always be used to sweeten the tea rather than sugar. When serving the tea to the prince, the teaspoon should be situated precisely to the right underneath of the handle of the cup. Clive Goodman, a royal reporter for News of the World, claimed that Prince Charles does nothing himself. He described the morning scene in which Charles gets ready for the day, but all the preparation is done for him. He gets up in the morning, his bathrobe is there waiting for him. He walks into the bathroom, the bath is drawn for him already. Even when he gets out of the bath, the towel is already folded in a special way so he just has to sit in it and wrap it around himself. Then he goes into the dressing room, his clothes are laid out for him, even his socks, left and right, are in the exact right spot. Charles even has valets squeeze one inch of toothpaste onto his toothbrush every morning. If anyone gets anything wrong, everyone is scolded. Gosh, and I'm sure y'all remember the viral video of him from September of 2022, forcing a servant to come clear off the desk of like three pieces of paper because he couldn't have done it himself. Number seven, check on the dead. 
Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love. Maybe a bit too much. Hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work, even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin? They have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you. I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake, which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka the Lost Queen of Egypt, was only 15 years old when she married 16-year-old Akhenaten. Now, alongside her new young husband, she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens, or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt 
Egypt's religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aten. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aten was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people, and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally, coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII, ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria, during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen, because there was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack, and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag, your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was opposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. We'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, 
Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number eight, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the pirate queen of Ireland. Pirate queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There, she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones' locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530, around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused, and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess. And not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. And before he went around dismantling religions to get some nookie, Henry was a devout choir boy. You might know Henry as the king who split from Rome and brought around the Anglican faith, but in his youth, Henry was a vehement supporter of Catholicism and its head. He sent tin from Cornwall to adorn the roof of Pope Julius II's new palace. He supported the papacy and in 1521 even published a book length slam poem against the German Protestant reformer Martin Luther. He referred to Luther as a venomous serpent, a pernicious plague, an inferal wolf, an infectious soul, a detestable trumpeter of pride, calamities, and schism. In recognition of Henry's forceful piety, Pope Leo the X, I can't remember that number, awarded him the title of Fidi de Defensier, aka Defender of the Faith. Henry was actually going to join the church himself before his older brother Arthur died and left him a throne and a wife to take care of. Scarcely a decade after being called Defender of Faith, Henry led a schism of his own, cleaving the Church of England into the wider Catholic Church after the Pope Clement refused to annul Henry's 16 year marriage to Catherine. Oh, it's time, y'all, because you may have known he was a womanizer, but did you know Henry was also a consistent king? What do I mean? Have you guys ever paid attention to the names of his wives? So, they were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. So it went, Catherine, Anne, Jane, Anne, Catherine, Catherine. I feel like if Henry had lived longer, there would have been another Anne and a Jane that would have come along and then another Catherine, Catherine. Ironically, Jane Seymour, the middle wife and the only unique name in the bunch, was Henry's favorite. But more on that sappy tale in a bit. There's a common belief that Henry married and discarded his six wives in quick succession, but that's not exactly true. When Henry's older brother died, he inherited a kingdom and a wife, Catherine, and they remained married for nearly 24 years. During that time, Catherine was faithful to to Henry, but Henry was sticking it in any lady he could find, except Anne Boylan. Who made him wait? So his answer, annul a whole marriage just to get some. But as mentioned, Pope wouldn't do that, so Henry had to start a whole new religion just so he could. Guess he shouldn't have done that, because Henry gets so desperate to end the relationship with Anne, he makes up allegations, maybe history's rocky on that, of adultery and treason, and had the marriage annulled and her beheaded. Jane had served as a lady-in-waiting to both Catherine and Anne, and I kid you not, Anne and Jane had gotten in actual fistfights because of Anne's jealousy. So just Picture a 15th century cat fight. On October 12th, 1537, Jane gave birth to Edward, their only male heir, and then died from complications due to the birth several weeks later. This is the only woman Henry had actually truly loved, and the loss decimated him for two years. His next wife, another Anne, catfished him with her portrait. Turns out she's ugly, and they amicably divorce after six months, so she lives out her life in comfy luxury in the country. Smart woman. The next Catherine was all young and hot at the time when Henry was repugnant and unable to walk, and it was more of a classic sugar baby situation. She cheated a bunch and got beheaded. The final Catherine was a grown up mature adult woman, shockingly a widow or two, and of all of Henry's wives, Catherine had the most influence on the court culture, religion, and role of women, and she also persuaded Henry to restore his daughters Mary and Elizabeth to the order of succession. When you marry at that many women, however, it's actually easy to see where his heart laid. Years before his death, Henry made plans to build a monumental tomb for himself, but also Jane Seymour. She truly was his favorite queen, the one woman he definitely loved and the mother of his only surviving male heir. Henry went as far as to confiscate a black marble sarcophagus that was originally intended for the powerful churchman Cardinal Walsley to be used at the center of their tomb. The monumental tomb was in the works for most of his time on the throne, but during the tumultuous years after his death in 1547, it was never completed. So Henry and Jane were left to rest in peace in what was going to be temporary lodgings in Windsor Castle until said monument was all wrapped up. But it never did, and the kingdom was so bankrupt that it didn't really ever come around. So, completing
getting it seemed a little impractical. It had been a long time, and Henry's intended tomb is now actually home to another famous figure. Two and a half centuries later, the sarcophagus became part of an ornate national monument, the final resting place of Horatio Nelson, the great British naval hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Anyways, on to his children, because these poor guys were nearly victims of their dad's dirty plan. For the longest time, Henry didn't have a legitimate male heir, so he decided to concoct what, had it come to fruition, might have been the grossest marriage ever. Although I feel like the Habsburgs would hear that sentence and as a challenge say hold my beer. Anyways, Jane may have popped out Henry's only official heir, but he did have an illegitimate son by his mistress. Henry Fitzroy, a surname that literally means son of the king, so a hilarious thing to name your bastard child, was named Duke of Richmond. In order to ensure that his country didn't descend into literal war again over lack of male heir, King Henry wanted Fitzroy to be the next monarch. How may you ask? Why marry the boy to his half sister Mary? This plan got so close to fruition that the cup already had the green light from the Pope. Thankfully, Fitzroy was in love and married someone else. When Fitzroy died at age 17, it left the door open for Henry's legitimate kids to take the throne. Thankfully, as mentioned, Jane ensured both daughters as well as the son got their chance. And speaking of Fitzroy's half sister, Bloody Mary, she wasn't the only family member that wasn't all there. Henry the Heck Dick is next. It's widely known that quite a few of these famous noble and aristocratic lines were also plagued by mental illness. Various theories have pointed at Henry's syphilis and brain injuries as possible causes. After all, it would be logical to assume that the damage occurred to the frontal lobes from having a horse buck him off twice. That region of the brain processes impulse control, external cues from other actions, and social and lustuous behavior. He also began to comfort eat around this period. Everyone's heard of that person who's had a stroke and just wasn't the same afterwards. So brain damage likely could be the explanation. In 2020, researchers actually discovered what they believe is the site where Henry received the blow to his head that could have caused traumatic brain injury. But it might come down to hereditary psychiatric problems in the family. His paternal great grandmother, Catherine of Valois, was the daughter of the famously mentally ill King Charles III. Her family's psychiatric issues seem to have been passed down through generations to multiple British monarchs. In his later years, Henry had a significant personality shift towards paranoia, fits of rage, depression, and anxiety. And he sent crowds of prisoners to the Tower of London. He sent more men and women to their deaths than any other English monarch and estimated 57 to 72,000 people. Yikes. Dictator numbers. But one thing about Henry, no matter how unhealthy homeboy got, he earned that chub. Huge misconception. Henry was only morbidly obese in the last few years of his life. For a long time before that, however, he was one of the most handsome and hella fit men of his era. Dude was well over six foot and had a 34 inch waist. In 1536, Henry was taking part in a tournament when he fell off his horse and the horse fell on him, leaving the king unconscious for several hours and forever altering his cheerful outgoing personality. This is the second horse related mass head injury Henry sustained. After this injury and the further ulcer development in his legs, Henry was left pretty much unable to exercise. His made to measure suits of armor chart the king's expansion with his final set around 1540, suggesting he weighed more than 300 pounds within a waist of 54 inches. As a matter of fact, Henry was so overweight he needed a mechanical device to help him get in and out of bed. When he died in 1547, he weighed nearly 400 pounds with a 60 inch waist. Impressive in a time before 10 cheeseburgers for $10, but I mean, if you're over 50, ruled a kingdom, injured his health around 30 years, you can just let go. Who cares? And last, but never the least, Henry was a hypochondriac king. Henry was obsessed with sickness and disease, specifically the sweating sickness and the plague. This is pretty fair. By the age 30, he'd already caught smallpox and malaria a couple times. Anytime there was an outbreak of anything, he would minimize his risk of infection by straight up leaving London and limiting the number of ambassadors he saw. Even when Anne Boleyn caught the sweating sickness in 1528, Henry said peace and stayed far away until she got better. Henry, bad husband. Good infection minimizer though. Naturally, like any germaphobe, Henry was doing the most to feel clean. So he was known to self-medicate. He even wrote his own prescription book, which detailed how to treat ulcers and reduce inflammation. He diagnosed himself with so many illnesses and disorders that it was actually hard to keep track of all of them. From migraines to insomnia and gout, Henry's life was spent dealing with and or avoiding various different diseases and ailments. Despite his many tyrannical qualities, Henry wasn't all that bad. He actually improved English medicine due to his outlandish paranoias, bringing the country further into the Renaissance. As the founder of the Royal College of Physicians, the king also passed seven different laws to control the practice of medicine. In 1540, Henry pushed through one of the earliest laws to regulate drugs. Apothecary wares had to be checked to make sure no one was defrauding honest customers. His reign also contributed to the increase of supervision of sewers thanks to his chancellor and future victim, Sir Thomas More, who drastically improved the quality of London's public water supply. Kicking off the list at number 10, a goodnight kiss. 
We'll start off funny, okay? History can be funny sometimes, even when it's not meant to be, and it's meant to be completely serious, I can't help but read this information and laugh. Royals were sweating constantly about people trying to take them out, of course. I mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy stalked the Queen over and over for years. Historically, these royals have been on the lookout for enemies, and the way that they prevent these attacks, yeah, sometimes it can be a little funny. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you heard about this weird position in the castle? What an odd job this is. A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned their ale, which is, you know, a pretty lousy job there. Either having a good day or a bad day, no in between. But they also had a guy kiss the king's sheets every day, just they just kissed the entire bed. The king size, may I remind you, massive bed. King Henry VIII, this guy hired somebody to literally just go in, get snuggled up, and just make sure the king's bed wasn't poisoned. There's nothing on it that's gonna make the skin go all ouchy. But he would just get in his bed and just Let's go to sleep for a bit. You are required to make the king's bed every morning, of course, and before he gets back in, you gotta get in and you gotta get in and kiss that bed, man. You gotta kiss that bed real good. Mwah, mwah. Let's go. Mwah. All right, time to clock out for the day. Mwah. One more for good luck. Clothes as well. That was touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure worn and touched. With It's so weird. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed. No way. I'd rather get poisoned. Like, yo, take my jeans off. Who is that guy? Get back here. Like, imagine marrying that king, and it's like, oh, hang on, before we get snugged in, this guy has to go and kiss your sheets. She's like, ew, what? Why does my sheets smell like breath? Everything smells like breath. Number nine, enemas. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the household. This, yeah. Back in the olden days, ye olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Well, rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies. Specifically, King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. Just big old fan of enemas. It's believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Thousands. It's a lot of, a lot of decimals. Decimals for enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. Like, guy, that's like 112 too much, I'd say. I don't know. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier, by using um, almond milk for the enemas. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out almond milk and you're like, oh no, not again, come on, Louis, please, I just ate. Number eight, no bathing in this house. Bathing in the olden days wasn't fully understood, if that makes any sense. Like in a medical book, in an official 16th century medical book, the medical advice was use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? What? What does it even mean? Why is every shred of medical knowledge always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century, a doctor would just be like, ah yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick and you'll be on your way. Like what? Do you have any halls? Help me. Help me, dude. No, I'm just mad. I just like, bro, I have pneumonia. I need, I need medicine. So of course they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. Of course. So King James IV, apparently this guy never took a bath in his life. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass lice to others just by being in the same room that he was earlier. So not at the same time, he would come in, do his king stuff, leave, and the lice would be like, Pew! and they would just wait in that room and get on someone else. That's so gross, that's horrible. Lice would emit off this man, like the, he's like the stinky kid from Charlie Brown with the stinky cloud. That's just like lice around this guy. <laughs> Margaret Tudor was married to King James. Yeah, must have loved the no bathing thing, eh? <laughs> At number seven, dental tools. Peter the Great was the Tsar of Russia from 1682 until his passing in 1725. The ruler had his hobbies to pass his time, but one of the weirdest ones was amateur dentistry. Peter was fascinated by the practice, and by amateur, I'm talking he actually had no idea what he was doing at all. Peter collected dental tools as well as people's teeth and a number of other peculiar items, including pickled lizards. Peter's private collection was known as his Chamber of Curiosities, and and he would apparently collect the teeth from people that caught his attention. In fact, Peter loved pulling people's teeth so much that he would even remove his target's healthy teeth in the middle of his passion. I'm not sure what the tools or the process was like for pulling teeth back then, but I'd have to imagine you did not want to be chosen to be his next victim. His collection of teeth is still around along with the rest of his weird collection, but I think this is one that I don't need to see. 
number 6 Explicit Collection King Farouk was the 10th ruler of Egypt, lasting on the throne from April 1936 until July 1952. As king, he was known for his extravagant playboy lifestyle, and while initially popular, his reputation went down due to the corruption and incompetence of his government. He was deposed in 1952 and spent the remainder of his days exiled to Italy. In his hurry to get out of there and avoid the Mussolini treatment, the king left behind a majority of his prized possessions. Farouk was a kleptomaniac and one of his hobbies was picking people's pockets. Along with his collection of stolen goods, the former king also had an extensive collection of explicit materials. The collection was so extensive that when the new government took over, they auctioned off his belongings and was decided that he had accumulated the world's biggest collection of explicit images. People also discovered expensive suits, rare stamps and coins, luxury cars, but his collection of adult content had to be the most jarring to the people going through his things. It's hard to place a number on just how much material he had, but apparently Farouk's collection was too big to fit under a mattress. That being said, reportedly there was a photo album found under his pillow. At number 5, Too Many Castles King Ludwig II of Bavaria, also known as the Swan King or the Fairy Tale King, was the monarch from 1864 until his passing in 1886. Ludwig was a fan of the opera, arts, and spending money in an irresponsibly extravagant way. When Ludwig took the throne, he was only 18 and he increasingly withdrew from day to day affairs of state in favor of extravagant artistic and architectural projects. Today, the former king is known for his fairy tale castles, Neuschwanstein Castle, Linderhof Place, and Heron Chiemsee. Ludwig certainly had a talent with his impressive castles being the inspiration behind Walt Disney's Cinderella Castle, but he got a little carried away building one too many castles. He was also a devoted patron of the composer Richard Wagner. Ludwig spent all his own private royal revenues on these projects, borrowed extensively, and defied all attempts by his ministers to restrain him. Ludwig's castles left him in increasing debt, and in 1886, a group of conspirators filed a medical report drafted by doctors who hadn't actually examined him that declared him permanently unfit to rule. The next morning, he and his personal physician were found floating in a lake under mysterious circumstances that many believed to be homicide. At number four, funeral for a doll. Tsar Peter III of Russia was the emperor from January 5th, 1762 until January 9th of the same year, being thrown over by his wife, Catherine the Great. Catherine earned her nickname simply due to her being just that, great. But her husband on the other hand, according to every account, was creepy, malevolent, and possibly bordering on insane. In her memoirs, Catherine describes him herself as an inept, crude man-child and a drunkard unfit to rule an empire who wished nothing but to play with toys or dress up as a general, place his servants in military outfits, and play war games with them. Peter was also known for loving, collecting, and playing with toy soldiers in his room. One day, Catherine found a rat hanging on his wall. According to The Empire of Russia, Its Rise and Present Power by John Stevens, Catherine wrote, quote, One day when I went into the apartments of His Imperial Highness, I beheld a great rat which he had hanged with all the paraphernalia of an execution. I asked what all this meant. He told me that this rat had committed a great crime, which according to the laws of war, deserved capital punishment. Basically, the rat had chewed the head off one of his beloved dolls, he wanted a full funeral, and Catherine wanted nothing to do with him. At number 3, Enemas. King Louis XIV of France ruled from May 1643 until September 1715. The former French ruler was apparently quite a big fan of using enemas on a regular basis. If you don't know, an enema involves inserting fluid into the lower bowel through the rectum, aiming to empty the bowels, often for a medical examination or administering medication. To be fair, back then it was a common thing to do among royals and nobles of Europe as it was thought to be very good for your health. Even so, Louis was the enema. King. Rumor has it that Louis XIV had thousands of enemas performed throughout his life. It was not uncommon that the king excused himself after dinner, went to his private apartment, had an enema, and then returned to join his courtiers. The king ended up living quite a long life, 76 years, and he credited his long life to his regular enemas. The elite of France were not going to be using just any water for this delicate practice either. Instead, the fluids were perfumed with rose, orange, and angelica, and was
was even slightly colored by the request of the users. Louis's father and grandfather had been fond of enemas too, but he preferred his with almond milk. During one year, he had 212 enemas performed. At number two, mummies. Similar to those who paid for Mamiya to heal them, King Charles II of England kept a number of mummies. They were not for educational or entertainment purposes, but simply to gather their dust. This dust was made up of dried skin and whatever else you might find on a mummified corpse, and Charles would actually rub it all over his own body. I guess back then they really hoped that the deceased had magical healing powers, but looking back now, knowing what we do, that's just nasty. Could you imagine just showering in mummy dust thinking, this is going to make me so great? Charles II believed that by doing this, he could acquire some ancient pharaoh greatness for himself. To be fair, they had a lot of wild beliefs back then, so this wasn't unheard of, but paying for a corpse's dead skin is still insane. King Charles wasn't done there either. He also paid grave diggers to bring him cadavers so he could use their skulls to make an alcoholic concoction called the King's Drops, which he prepared in his personal laboratory. These drops were made from crushed up human skulls and skull moss from Ireland, and the king purchased the concoction for 6,000 euros. And at number one, tall men. King Frederick Wilhelm I of Prussia ruled from February 1713 until May 1740 and was the founder of the Potsdam Giants. This name was given to the Prussian Infantry Regiment No. 6. This group of soldiers was made up of men above 6 feet tall and was eventually dissolved in 1806 after being defeated by Napoleon. Frederick recruited these tall men willingly and unwillingly from various nations. The king himself only stood 5 foot 3 inches tall and the taller soldiers were believed to be a pretty obvious case of overcompensation. Eventually, Frederick became a little too obsessed with collecting gigantic men that he eventually resorted to buying, taking, or breeding them into the regiment to booster his ranks. Frederick Wilhelm was apparently not nice to his troops, treating them more like possessions to show off rather than humans. The king would show off his troops like toys to foreign dignitaries and even painted portraits of them as they marched at his command. The king once said the most beautiful girl or woman in the world would be a matter of indifference to me. But tall soldiers, they are my weakness. By the time he passed, the number of tall soldiers had climbed to 2,500, and Potsdam was littered with unusually tall men by the 18th century. Starting with his entrusted and encrusted craft man. In Henry's court, his servants vied to be as physically close to the king as possible at all times. In case you aren't aware, especially towards the end of his reign, Henry was a tad bit of a lunatic. The more he liked you, the less likely you were to die for looking at him funny on a bad day of his. But Naturally, the monarch reserved the honor of being close to his royal person only for a trusted few people. The grooms of the stools. No, not his counselor, personal butler, none of his advisor, the guy that wiped his ass. And during his reign, only four men got the gig of groom of the stool, the most physically intimate position and therefore the most honored of his attendants. These grooms not only helped dress and undress the king before and after the bathroom and, you know, handled the poop brush for him, but in an insane twist, they also controlled public and personal access to the monarch and some of his final Finances. They even had power over a stamp of the king's signature, which is a major financial tool. Imagine being one of his wives and having to ask the guy who wipes your husband's ass if you can talk to him, and he says no. But if he could afford that kind of luxury employee, why was he called the copper-nosed king? Easy. While Henry's kingdom amassed a great wealth and property during the English Reformation by confiscating Catholic monasteries, Henry then turned around and drove England into debt with his overspending and lavish lifestyle. Dude was a complete eclectic, and he wanted to buy everything shiny and pretty he saw, so he did. It's reported by the time he dropped, Henry owned approximately 50 palaces, 6,500 plus weapons, 70 ships, 78 recorders, 78 flutes, five sets of bagpipes, and a virginal. Get your mind out of the gutter, it's a type of harpsichord. Not to mention the millions of dollars he pumped into wars with Scotland and France. So it's pretty obvious he was burning through the kingdom's funds, and by the end of his reign, Henry had it down to the pocket change. Quite literally. He was forced to lower the percentage of silver in the British coinage to the point that they were mostly copper with the silver coating that wore away from the coins embossed image of Henry's face, starting with the nose. Thus, copper nose. When Henry's son Edward took the throne, the royal coffers were in a real bad state. But before we get to his love life and kiddos, let's learn about how Frisky runs in the family. It's well known that Henry's older brother, the first husband of Henry's first wife, Catherine, died young. But did you know he had two royal sisters who made his life a living hell for fun? Henry's older sister, Margaret, was just as feisty as her brother. She was sent to Scotland to marry that country's king, James IV, at just 13. She did produce an heir after a couple years, the future James V, but her 
her crappy adulterous playboy spouse didn't live terribly long. So as a single queen, Margaret wanted to keep up her luxe lifestyle at her brother Henry's expense, which he did not love. Maggie battled it out with the Scottish nobles over the right to serve as her son's regent, but she fell for and married another Scottish noble, the Earl of Angus. Henry's other sister, Mary, had some equally troublesome marriage issues, at least for Henry. He married her first to the elderly King Louis of France, but that monarch passed away very shortly after. A smart woman who recognized being married to a literal senior could kind of work in her favor made Henry promise her before her marriage if she was to be widowed, her next husband would be a man of her own choosing. Henry agreed, which hilariously was a bad idea but only for him because now a widow, Mary chose to wed a commoner who was Henry's best friend, Charles Brandon. The king was furious that Mary would marry against his will since he had no intention of keeping his promise to her and that her second wedding took away the opportunity for him to make alliances using her. But Mary and Brandon told him to suck it and stayed married till her death. Their descendants included the Lady Jane Grey, the infamous Nine Day Queen. Number seven, Galizo Maria Saforza. This guy was just bad. Like, like all bad. Not like Deadpool where he does some bad stuff for good reasons, anti-hero kind of guy. This, nah, this guy's just straight bad, straight evil. In one story of the disturbed king, he had a rival's hands chopped off. No more tennis matches. He left prisoners in hanging cages and even had a priest that made a prediction about him that he didn't find all too flattering in prison with little food and water. It got to the point where the man had to eat his own refuse. So if you cross Galeazzo Maria Saforza, um, don't, don't do it. Number six, Ivan the Terrible. I'm not that familiar with Russian history before the year 1900, but there is a lot to unpack. It's not all Lenin and hammers and sickles and such. Ivan the Terrible was the first Tsar of Russia, and he was quite the specimen. From having struck his daughter-in-law and unlifing his son in a fit of rage, he was one nasty dude. However, I believe the story of him in St. Basil's Cathedral is more noteworthy. As the story goes, Ivan commissioned an architect to build St. Basil's Cathedral. If you've ever seen it, you know how gorgeous it is. All the Onion Palace buildings and whatnot, you know what I'm talking about. Ivan was so impressed with the architect's work that he had his eyes gouged out so that no one could ever build another structure or gaze upon another structure as magnificent as the cathedral. That's hardcore, dude. That's pretty hardcore. So if you do a bad job, he probably would have got rid of you. And if you do a good job, he'll still get rid of you. Number five, Ferdinand the First of Naples. This one is so strange. I. I can't even, I, I have to mention, I, I cannot not say it. In a nutshell, Ferdinand looked normal, just your average European king. I mean, what, what could be wrong about this guy, right? He looks pretty normal. Well, the guy was basically Buffalo Bill. Ferdinand liked to keep his enemies close, taken after a little bit of Michael Corleone. However, so close that oftentimes dinner guests would mysteriously disappear and end up not breathing. Afterwards, they would be mummified and pickled and dressed as if they were still alive. He would then invite more guests over for dinner to show them what could happen if they crossed him. He would open the doors and show them a sick dinner-esque area play thing of people dressed up and that's, that's, that's what bad people do. That's what Buffalo Bill would do. That's gross, we don't like that. Number four, Henry VIII. Are you even surprised he's on this list? I mean, come on, it's Henry VIII. But I, I support all healthy marriages and I support healthy divorces. Sometimes things just don't work out, but that doesn't mean you have to go all Johnny Depp on the situation. There's better ways to work things out. Well, in Henry's case, it may not be televised on national TV or global TV in this case. It was more like Edward Scissorhands, if you will. Henry VIII is famous for dealing with his wives. When the church would not grant him the divorce he so wished for, he removed his wife's head from her body. And then he remarried and divorced another, and then he, uh, well, another one lost her head and then divorced another, and then finally he passed away and the wife lived on. It makes sense, sure, that's, all I'm saying is the man went a little too far, that's all I'm saying, just a little bit. Number three, John King of England. This is the dude who wrote the Magna Carta, which for legal students everywhere is like Planet Krypton. It's where it all starts, the whole Superman, the law, everything. It's the basis of everything. Besides Hammer Robbie's Code, of course. Well, it's not like he signed it very enthusiastically, and the man really wasn't the nicest. He's also known for taking 22 of his most noble knights and throwing them away in a dungeon until they starved and didn't wake up for, well, no breakfast. 
He betrayed his brother Richard the Lionheart, the very famous Richard the Lionheart, who also wasn't very nice either, and is suspected of being the mastermind behind the delifing of his nephew. Ooh, talk about family scandal. Number two, Napoleon Bonaparte. I know, hear me out though. The story of France and Napoleon is one for the history books. I mean, really, it's, it's so strange. Imagine a country that violently overthrows its king and queen, and then while in the middle of that, which could be described as the worst political strife in history, you then go to war, which, if you know how that, it's, it's not a good idea. You, 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 you're probably going to lose. Except Napoleon didn't lose. Napoleon took France to war like five times within a, a short time period and won most of them. It's pretty good. Well, good for winning, not good for the people that didn't make it. That's when he declared himself Emperor of France and kind of lost his way, which it's stupid because it defeated the whole purpose and point of the revolution and the democracy that the people were so fighting for. Eventually, the international community caught up with him and banned him to an island twice because he came back and said, I'm back, and then, no, back to the island. Go go back, you're, go you're going back. Number one, Elvis Presley. Look, I know, I know, it's it's Elvis, but he's the king of rock and roll, man. You, you can't go wrong with Elvis. It, plus, it kind of works, too, because I think people have a really good image of him, but he actually wasn't, you'll see. He is the king of rock and roll, to be fair, and he's more famous than any king on this list, actually, but the king of rock and roll isn't so squeaky clean and certainly not a stranger to crime and scandal. At some points in his career, you could find him excessive drinking and using um, illicit substances, if you will. He might have had to put on those jailhouse rocking denims, well, for real. Back in 1956, at the peak of his fame, really, Elvis got into a physical altercation with two gas station attendants after fans began to crowd him, it was a messy situation, and he was actually up on charges of battery and disorderly conduct. Not a good look for the king, baby. The king's gotta stay clean. Number 10, King Charles I. You can put any king down on this list, really. Uh, people weren't as kind and loving as we are now. Or, or well, less cruel, I guess. <laughs> king Charles was no different from any other. A monarch sniffing his own farts up in his castle, doing his very best to snuff out religious groups that he didn't agree with. A lot of guys were like that. It's brutal, but that's history, folks. Well, one such measure he took, I think, was so wrong, so heinous, and so criminal, and so offensive, that he should have been locked up for life. During the 1600s, this man, in an effort to curb religious views, outlawed Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Outlawed Christmas. That means no gifts, no tree, no Santa Claus, no turkey, no stuffing, no nothing. This was quickly dissolved after he was removed from office. And yes, I know Santa Claus wasn't there then, but st it's still, it's Santa Claus, it's Christmas. Can't have Christmas without Santa Claus. Number nine, William the Conqueror. You've all probably heard the name William the Conqueror. Battle of Hastings, illegitimate son of the king fighting for the throne, very violently too, I might add. However, today I want to talk about his dating skills. Look, dating can be hard. I, I, I get that. There's a lot of anxiety, especially when self-image comes into play. Ooh, I'm too fat. I hate my nose. And what are these legs? Ugh, no one's gonna like me. Everyone thinks like that. And it's always usually right before a date, too. You could be staring in the mirror, and then all of a sudden all your bruises, pimples, and blemishes seem to show up out of nowhere. It's weird how that works. Well, William was different though, he, he was more confident. He didn't have confidence issues like the rest of us. To quote a brilliant chemist, he was the one who knocks. As the story goes, he was quite fond of one lass. She was not fond of him. Classic story, really. So after trying to court her several times and failing, he decided to drag her on the ground by her hair until she said yes. Don't, don't do that, that's, that's bad. Number eight, Kangas Khan. I don't think some folks realize just how brutal this guy really was. I mean, if you've ever played the Ghost of Tsushima game on PlayStation, then you know exactly what the Mongol horde is capable of. Mossy things. The man carved out most of Asia and parts of Europe. In one battle allegedly taking the lives of one million people. And all that remained was a mountain of bones and human fat. Ooh, gross. He's been known on how not to treat a lady and reportedly liked to use his young and newest soldiers as arrow fodder by creating human shields with them. A lot of conscripts in his army were often taken from villages that he conquered. It's kind of how he kept the machine going. So either fight with me or that's picture app for you. What a nice guy. What a swell nice guy. Jeez. Boy. Number seven, Queen Caroline. Queen Caroline. 
Ba, ba, ba. She went out in a horrible way. We can't sing about her. History remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she went out. It was bad. It was actually written down in an epigram attributed to the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Again, it rhymes. Why do all the, why is everything rhyming? This is so awful. Who can be like, yeah, yeah, write that down. That's good. That's good. Wait, wait. It does rhyme. That's good. That checks out. Rest in peace. My gosh, her husband, he was certainly no help at all. Caroline was previously married to George IV, and this guy locked her out of Westminster on Coronation Day. So yeah, she went out in a horrible way, but let's not forget the marriage that came beforehand. That wasn't pleasant either. Nothing in this guy or this marriage was pleasant. Number six, Henry VIII. Of course he's back. He had six wives, and it was pretty much entirely bad for all of them, yeah. It was the late 1400s. Henry took the throne in 1509. This guy was only 17 years old when all this madness began to unfold. Only days after the execution of Anne, who I mentioned on part one of this list, so days after he married his third wife, Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour's mothers were first cousins, so they were close, and during all of this, they, of course, went head to head more than once. Jane died shortly after giving birth to Edward VI on October 12, 1537. I can't mention King Henry's wives and leave a couple out. This is just a history channel. We have to mention all of them, okay? Number five, George V. Turned out this guy loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much though, I'd say. It was almost distracting. It was taking up many hours of his day. Like, you know, focused on other things, like say maybe, I don't know, the war. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everyone's trying to stay alive. George is just in the background like. <laughs> like all collections, they started at an early age. It's now at a point where it's just, you know, past impressive and borderline strange. Especially if you're a royal, like you're really going hard with this. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages, full of stamps. That's 20,000 pages full of stamps. That's a lot, way too many stamps. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather the King of Philately. That's the official term for collecting stamps. We're historians here, we have to make it official. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record. Ho ho, the most money ever spent on a stamp. This guy dropped like 220,000 on one single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about the fool who had spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp. And he was proud, he was like, like, oh, that fool? It was I. Number four, Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. Yeah, some princes collected stamps, other collect zoo animals. We're all different. Yeah, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and not bears, but orangutans. So good luck getting your eight hours. He also collected human artifacts, like body parts after they've been, you know, so that's Watch your step, I guess. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Watch out for the lion's tail. Careful. What a mess. He's quite important in history though, I guess. He supported the scientific revolution and he also poured tons of money into astrology. So next time you read your horoscope, remember it's bones in the jar Benny that's responsible for that one. And also in case you're wondering, yeah, he didn't pay attention to any of his wives or anything like that. He was just, no, nope, jars for me, jars of animals. I'm all set. Number three, Don Carlos. Spanish crown prince, the guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Let's talk about him. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was, yeah, I want to say worse things, but he was just a really bad person. YouTube, he was just a bad guy. Now it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter than the other. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him with these disabilities growing up and people often feel bad for him a little. To that I say don't. Nah, don't do it. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad. Dude was fine. Philip II of Spain? Yeah, he would hurt a lot of people. He would hurt animals and people just for fun. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how the pair of boots looked. He made somebody eat boots. We're not gonna feel bad for him on Bumblebee today. That's not what we're gonna do. He was also set up to marry Queen Elizabeth of Valois, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours, she was like, no, that's not gonna happen, no way. So she married his father instead. That's what happens, that's what happens when you're In 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos. Mary Queen of Scots was one of them. Margaret of Valois, we know what happened with her, and Anna of Austria, but his mental conditions grew worse and it went south, shocker. Number two, heart of glass. King Charles VI, once nicknamed the beloved and then quickly nicknamed the mad. What happened? After he became king of France in 1380, he would have these 
episodes, let's call them. He would believe he was made of glass and he didn't want anybody to touch him. He had this glass delusion, which was surprisingly not uncommon, believe it or not, for this time period. Believing you were made out of glass in some way, shape or form, be it in your head, butt, shoulders or back, really spiked around the mid 1400s and Charles VI, AKA Charles the Mad, he wouldn't let anybody, not even his wife, near him at all. I'm not making fun of somebody for having a fear like that. I mean, most likely historians believe he was schizophrenic, so obviously I'm not ripping on that. But Alexandria of Bavaria, another royal who had this glass delusion, she too believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass, so she had to enter rooms sideways to avoid it shattering. I don't know what's going on with this glass delusion, but I'm glad it went away, I don't know. And finally, number one, King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians. So that should already tell you a good amount of this guy. George was another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his, you know, intimate side quests, if you know what I'm saying here, like all these other kings we've talked about. He was a bit busy being a stupid fool. This man was trying literally everything to get a woman to sleep with him. Although he was the king and he was already set up, he was like, nope, I'm gonna go and keep trying with strangers and random. And he would throw a tantrum if they said no, or he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get the girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? One of those kind of monsters. He would also keep uh, trophies, lack of a better term, of all these conquests afterwards. He would ask each people that he slept with for a little piece of hair and then he would keep them, he would like store them. Back then it was kind of common, I guess, for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair. Weirdly enough, because you don't have phone numbers or like any sort of way to remember someone, photos, I don't know. So you kept their hair. But after the king died, his brother found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. So yeah, I'll leave you on that note. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen or rather empress who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So. Surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel is corset poke off but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks that should be a musical not frozen get out of here at number eight no side bays a bad relationship can really mess you up anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de Medici did back in the day her didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken she basically turned into the type of person that was like if I'm not happy no one else is gonna be happy either Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time and as a final
final F you to her husband. Not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband though, Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number 7 Mary Queen of Scots I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband, she loved until he became a drunkard, and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded, but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons, but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death, but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So so she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegun of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild, who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number three, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Technically not a queen. I get it. But she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. 
after she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly, when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after, Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed, but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number two, Catherine de' Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible, so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general, which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father Henry VIII ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison. Kicking off the list at number 10. A fool. While ancient kings have all the riches one man can possibly have, it's still somehow never enough. Kings also have their own walking, talking party. Yeah, how fun is that? The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. These fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, just jumping around on tables, telling jokes, juggling with big pointy shoes, wearing pajamas. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. It was pretty fun. One of the best jobs to have was the title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really, and the fool's payment was no joke. Roland Le Pichur was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II. As long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. Literally, he would show up and fart around. But these fools also held responsibility in their silly little lips. Fools needed to find the balance of humor and wit. It was harder back then than anything. Many of these jesters were given the rule of advisor to the king and queen. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, this is where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them horrible news, but in a fun, positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in naval battle, the British completely wiped them out, and it was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester, the fool, brought this news in a light way. He said to the king, they don't even have the guts to jump into the water like our brave French do. And then he farted and disappeared. Number nine, access to clean water. Today in a modern world, there are things that we just can't live without. A vape pen, Starbucks, and that weird looking back massager that everyone says they bought for their backs, but it's actually for their undercarriage. Speaking of undercarriages, you don't want to drink from the water from underneath one. Dirty, muddy street water is bad for your health. The ancient kings of old knew this. It was common knowledge that drinking dirty water could lead to you spending more time squatting over a hole than spending time with your family, and, and nobody wants that. Life for citizens who were not royals could have it pretty rough. Ancient kings had the luxury of having clean water. or. Somewhat, it's still kind of not so clean, or at least more clean than the commoners. Through methods of fresh spring water, boiling, and even some early filtration methods, they had access to better water that wouldn't make their guts hurt. With that being said, a lot of times, given the sussy nature of water, a lot of kings just drank alcohol, which honestly might have saved them since the alcohol could possibly kill harmful bacteria. The one time in life that boozing might save your life. Anyone got a beer? Number eight, ladies first. 
These ancient kings, they could literally do whatever they wanted. And it's important to note how they would act if they didn't get what they wanted, right? Like George IV of England, he's referred to as England's worst king by historians. Great title, even worse than King Joffrey, what do you know? It's one thing to spiral into debt, that's classic king behavior. MC Hammer went broke, we get it, it happens. But George IV, he was all about the ladies, a little bit too much. All he wanted in life was just to hook up with women. That was it, his only desire in life. And if they weren't interested, George was known to throw fits. He would cry and stomp his feet, literally. You know how those brave and bold kings do. George would offer these ladies money, although they weren't for sale, so that wasn't a great plan and didn't work a lot of the time. And George would go so far to threaten his own well-being if they refused. How terrible is that guy, right? Just imagine that conversation, how insane. What takes this to the absolute next level though is that George would keep a lock of his partner's hair after they had spent the night together. Now I know you're freaking out, maybe you're like, huh? Maybe you just choked on your rye bread sandwich a bit, that's more than fair. At the time, this wasn't abnormal behavior. I mean, you know, lovers would exchange their hair instead of phone numbers, I get it, it's back in the old days. But George, he had a lot of hair. He had like a lot, a lot of hair. He had like 7,000 envelopes filled with hair. I'm over here exchanging phone numbers at the club. Like, what am I doing wrong? Am I, doink? Call me, peace. But to appeal to my ancient alien theorists, is it alien matter? On the flip side of Educated Leaps, we have alien conspiracy. Egypt's own antiquities ministry announced a few years ago that there were signs of extraterrestrial activity discovered after some radar scans of King Tut's tomb. The radar scans, according to French archaeologist Avril Sapp, refuted theories that Queen Nefertiti's tomb is hidden beyond that of King Tut, and instead revealed weird and extraterrestrial material appeared to resemble a body. However, both Sapp and unnamed antiquity officials refused to answer questions concerning whether or not it could be alien remains. But the AO did confidently boast they could not even come up with something like this in the National Treasure or Indiana Jones movies. This is revolutionary. We don't know what there is, but we've never seen results like this before, said Sapp, who coincidentally discovered dinosaur bones in the Pyramid of Giza a few years ago on April 1st, 2014. Whatever's inside of there could hold secrets to everything behind ancient Egyptian history and technology. Egypt will continue to conduct radar testings and scanning to determine how to enter the hidden chamber without damaging anything inside. Next on the roster, how do you die? One important question that's likely never going to be answered by anything that might be contained in newly discovered chambers is how Tut died. Let's run through some of the many options, shall we? Was it A, King Tut's knee was broken so badly that it was a compound, the bone piercing the skin and causing massive bleeding. Although a fatal leg fracture fits the idea that Tut had died abruptly, it cannot be stated for medical certainty that the fracture occurred while Tut was alive. It's possible his knee was broken after death. Was it B? Tut's death was caused by an infection that resulted from said fracture. Not the result of a chariot crash, by the way, since Tut's physical impairments would have made chariot racing impossible. His immune system was weakened from several bouts of malaria. But maybe it was C. Tut may have been killed by an elderly chief advisor and successor, I. An x-ray of his skull revealed calcified blood clot at the base, and it could have been caused by a blow from a blunt instrument. Or maybe it's D. New analysis of CT scans from 03 show Tut was embalmed without his heart and interior chest wall. Structures that couldn't have been removed by tomb robbers or anyone else. The assumed cause was an extensive crushing and tearing injury like the bite of a hippopotamus. Despite not knowing how he died, we know after he did, there was a big ol' succession mess. Post Tut, the pharaoh get plot gets all dicey. Horma was the chosen heir for the throne and was off waging war against the Hittites. The coup theory for Tut's death revolved around his elderly chief chief advisor I, because we do not know how or why a high official like him came to be king of Egypt otherwise. He definitively stole the crown and throne from Horeme in his absence though. Ancient letters suggest that either Nefertiti or more likely Tut's widow Akinsenamun was desperate to prevent I from becoming pharaoh and asked the king of the Hittites, who they are at literal war with, to send a prince who could marry her and rule Egypt. An and Nefertiti are erased from history around that time. During his short reign, King I tried in vain to achieve peace with Sen Hittites, while also simultaneously trying to prevent Horame, the true regent of Tut, from seizing the throne while he's alive and after he died. To do so, he named an heir, an army commander named Nakahimti, who we know as perhaps to be Ai's own grandson. As you can imagine, Nakahimti became Horame's great rival, but Ai's successor would finally be Horam when his three year reign ends. Horam would then rule for nearly 30 years and then remove all known history of Tut 
and TAA Nefertiti and Tut's father Ah. Now that's a mystery as to why. And while we're on the topic, where is An? For over 3,000 years, her life has been a mystery to us and mostly made up of bizarre facts and strange omissions. Like that, despite being the third daughter of the pharaoh, she was once his wife too before marrying her half brother Tut. <laughs> when Tut died, the corrupt priests chose an heir, General Harambe, known lunatic. Anne was terrified and realized the kingdom was being lost to corruption in secret societies. She potentially writes to the King Hittites during their time of war, as mentioned, offering herself and the throne of Egypt to one of his sons. The prince in specific was Zanzania, and he set out for Egypt and is killed before he arrives. Historians believe this was Hormhem's doing. Anne is forced to marry Ai so he can steadfastly secure his place on the throne, and then, like that, she vanishes from history, an absence that some historians say signal her death. But it isn't the only time that has fragmented her story. An's role of ancient Egypt's most contentious period was lost deliberately, excised from the annals of history by the new dynasty that rose to power just decades later. DNA testing she may have been one of the female mummies found in Key V21, but for now she remains shrouded in mystery. The story of the cobra and canary is next. Howard Carter, self-taught archaeologist, plunderer, thief, and is responsible for the discovery and opening of King Tut's tomb. Prior to said opening, he had bought a golden canary, hoping its chatter and song would cheer up his empty house. When he first brought it home, one of his housemates tells Carter, "It's a bird of gold that will bring luck. This year we will find a tomb full of gold." Well, howdy doody! Either that bird summoned gold, or the maid is a fortune teller. Within a week of purchasing the canary, Carter discovers Tut's tomb, and before knowing whose tomb they had found, the workers nicknamed it the Tomb of the Golden Bird, a bird that becomes an omen of what's to come. During the recent excavations which led to the discovery of the tomb of Tuck Muhammad, Mr. Howard Carter had in his house a canary which daily regaled him with its happy song. On the day, however, on which the entrance to the tomb was laid bare, a cobra entered the house, pounced on the bird, and swallowed it. Now, cobras are rare in Egypt and seldom seen in winter, but in ancient times they were regarded as symbol of royalty, and each pharaoh wore the symbol upon his forehead as though to signify his power to strike and sting his enemies. And obviously this segues us to the classic mystery of the mummy's curse. I'm of the opinion anyone who pillages or destroys history deserves to have a curse, so Howard Carter and company, please continue rolling in your graves, bud, you earned this. So George Herbert funded the excavation and died from blood poisoning days later. Legend has it, when the Lord Carnivon died, all the lights in his house and in Cairo, Egypt mysteriously went out. Howard Carter gave a mummified hand wearing a bracelet inscribed saying, Cursed he be who moves my body to his friend Bruce ink him as a gift ink him that man did not like you His house burned to the ground not long after and when he tried to rebuild it was hit by a flood George J Gould dies after one visit Aubrey Herbert dies of gum rot Hugh Evelyn White takes his own life But not before writing in blood I have succumbed to the curse which forces me to disappear Aaron Ember and his whole family dies and Richard Bethel is suffocated by apparently the Satanist Alistair Crowley of all people Archibald Douglas Richard died three days after x-raying Tut, and then James Henry Breasted dies on his next Egypt trip. Mystery or what do you think? And last on our list is the alien jewel. The amazing story began 77 years after Carter's discovery when an Italian geologist noticed something odd about the yellow green scar up in the pectoral center. The subsequent tests proved that the lump of glass was older than any Egyptian society, a lot older in fact. Experts trace the scar back to the Great Sand Sea, 500 miles miles southwest of Cairo, in which there are known to be huge lumps of glass poking out of the dunes. The general opinion is that a meteor hit the desert hundreds of thousands of years ago, heating the sand enough to create glass. To give you the idea of the magnitude that this supposed impact, the first A-B testing done created a thin frost-like layer of glass in the New Mexico desert. Meanwhile, chunks of glass the size of literal human heads can be picked up from the Great Sand Sea to this day. That means this meteor hit with an impact that we humans can't recreate on a different type of scale. But there's no evidence of a meteor that has ever struck the desert. If this glass is of meteoric origin, then there should be a crater of that age, says Boston University Farouk Al-Baz. But no crater, let alone partially fused or a serial piece, has ever been found. This suggests the less exciting origin, a super saturated lake of silica that slowly dried into a natural glass hard enough to resist a scalpel mark. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. 
I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner Piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too, apparently it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster, end quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you have it a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. Number seven, food. Nice. Whether you like it or not, at some point in your life, you're gonna have to eat. And if you're like me, that means all the time. Steaks, ribs, beer, Burger King, pizza, pass the ham, and chicken wings. Nice. It should be no surprise that I like beer and barbecue. And to answer your question, yes, I am the most fun guy to be around at the barbecue. Why? I, I just like to have fun and I like to eat good food, man. That, that's just it. Imagine a world, however, where there is no pizza and chicken wings. I know, it's horrible, right? Ugh. Food was always a concern of commoners in ancient times, and as much as I love meat, it wasn't always available. They just didn't live in the industrial agricultural world that we live in today. For Romans, it was a steady diet of breads and nuts. And if they were lucky, maybe some cheese or soup. But for the kings and emperors of old, well, if you feel like vomiting after all you can eat buffets, it makes you feel, you know, some first world kind of guilt, then look no further than ancient kings. Food might be the most excessive way they live, really. All kinds of meats all the time, beer, wine, fresh fruit and vegetables, which for health reasons is pretty huge, and to make them huge, maybe even some desserts. The Egyptians, for example, were known for their sweets. And now I'm hungry. We should go to a banquet together. Number six, 6,000 knights. Being a medieval knight, obviously, it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, all that good stuff. They're saving the damsel in distress in some sort of tower. Well, no, it actually sucked being a knight at all. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone by itself? It's like 55 pounds. All that chainmail underneath your armor 
No way. My body, this Q-tip spine would just break in half. No way. I can't even get on a horse wearing jeans and a shirt, let alone chain mail. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You gotta start with a little, little tot, a little royal tot. Then you'd be given to a noble to learn and be wise for seven years, some, you know, Yoda type scenario. And then at age 14, you become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but if you stick it out, just seven more years, then you're an official ting, ting, knight, that's it. But then what? Do kings have two knights? Do they have four each? Is it like a breakdance squad? Is it like eights, groups of eights? Like, do we, how do we do this? Henry II of England could call up to 6,000 knights. This was back in the late 12th century. That's a lot of backup. That's a lot of shiny, majestical backup. My favorite knight still to this day, I don't care, Martin Lawrence. Jamal, Scott, I walk up. Happy up, what's up, what's happening y'all? Number five, big money. This is no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, but back in the day, I'd argue the division between wealth and poor was larger than today. Kings had it all. I mean, if you listen to what Taylor's saying, he, he knows what he's talking about. Food, water, power, what else is there? Well, how about the coinage to make it all happen? The bread, the guap, the dosh. And my favorite, the cheddar. Yes, that's right, the ancient king's wealth. Whatever they didn't already possess, they could take by force, or simply just bought with incalculable riches. With uncalculable riches. So much money, they had so much money. I can't make it clear, they had a lot of money. A great example of this was Mansa Musa, a very wealthy king from the Mali Empire. It's speculated he might have been the wealthiest person to ever walk the face of the earth. Earning his riches through the trading of gold and salt, he decided to show the international community how rich he was and went on tour, because that's just something you do when you have millions of dollars, I guess. Where in multiple cities, he spent and gave away so much gold that it upset the city's economies. That is, that is, a, that is a big flex, okay. Donald Trump might have hotels, but Mansa Musa Musa has everything else. It's kind of like Monopoly when one player has a boatload of cash and they go from one good property to the next. So you know if they land on something, they get all the cold hard. So even if they land on something, they got all the cold hard cash to deal with it. Plus, they also have some good property and they just make it back every turn anyway. I'm fed up with Monopoly. Number four, King of Castles. King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tale castles. Yeah, let's call this inspiration, I guess. What a privilege this ought to be. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the King of Bavaria back in 1864. And then he had castles built as, you know, he was inspired from romantic literature and spending time at the opera. You hear that, Andrew? He was inspired after the opera. What a poet. It's crazy. Crazy. Must be nice, right? King Ludwig II would spend his nights in one castle, looking through his fancy telescope, admiring the next castle being built. What a, what? Who, ha? He even freestyled the castle as well. Yeah, just four years in, the guy designed his own majestical castle. And to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world, so clearly he did something right. Neuschwanstein Castle, literal fairy tale. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm over here making castles in Minecraft. Still fun, we'll take it. Number three, jousting. First there is bread, and then there is wine, and then there is entertainment. You can't tell me why a delicious plate of nachos dances like a ballerina in your microwave, you didn't pull up some super cool content to watch in your phone. Maybe featuring a large, kind of funny comedian, and maybe also featuring a super handsome, tall, funny comedian with a neck thing, I don't know. Kings of ye olde times did not possess the power of the internet or watching fail videos, so watching combat sports was the next best thing. Oh, what's that I hear? Watching the sport isn't enough? Well, some royalty even got involved. King Henry VIII, for example, just loved to joust because because he did. He even had an accident with such, and it's what might have made him gone mad in the first place. Number two, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Here we go. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. What a monster. I would be asleep right now if coffee wasn't a thing. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he got a little wiser, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, may I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. The guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a, what a fun guy. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades just wandering the roads. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather Murad IV himself would just take off his hood and be like, surprise, and then he would take off your head. Right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All that for some stale ale. What a monster. 
Number one, groom of the stool. For some reason, this job was considered to be higher up, a well-respected job, if you will. However, I'd like to ask the man in charge of such an operation how he felt. Imagine, I can imagine he wasn't too fond of his job. Hands never clean, hands never clean. The groom of the stool is someone who would assist the king in his bathroom duties by supplying fresh water, towels, and whatever a king needs. He may have also been responsible for cleaning the forbidden starfish. May the divines of Skyrim have mercy on his soul. I guess this had to be done, but I don't know if I could ever even do that to another human being. If you've ever eaten Taco Bell late at night and washed it down with some Baja Blast, then you know the kind of explosion awaits the porcelain throne in the morning. So yes, having a servant present at your bowel movements is a privilege that most other folks just didn't have, but would you really want one? 